Welcome back to the Paranorm Girl podcast. I am your host, Kristen. We have to give credit where credit is due. I would not be talking about Bigfoot this season if it weren't for the multitude of folks out there who claim to have seen him, or the researchers, authors, and scientists who continue the hunt today because there is a mystery to be explored and enough evidence to support that continued search. Or the numerous Bigfoot research groups that span the country and make such cool discoveries such as prints and nest sites. My original wish for this episode was to showcase as many folks in the field as I possibly could because they all contribute so much. But there's a lot of you guys. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of you out there. And uh, I fear leaving anyone out. So instead, this episode is dedicated to you, the Bigfoot crowd. Today, we pay homage and respect to some of the original pioneers of this phenomenon, who, if it weren't for them and their early passion for the subject, today's extent of research and collected evidence may never have arrived. So, ladies and gents, this episode is part one of two about the four horsemen of Sasquatchery. We begin today's show with Mr. John Willison Green, following a word from today's sponsor and a special PGP announcement. Cheers to the new year from our friends at Manscaped, because his resolution shouldn't be the only things that are well kept. 2024 is the time for new heights, new opportunities, and a new look for his Times Square balls. Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is every man's cheat code to look good, feel good, and turn the page on confidence this year. Whether he's looking to maintain a trim or go for that clean-shaven look, this trimmer has him covered. Trusted by over 10 million men worldwide. 10 million with a 10. Now is the time for him to get a grip on his grooming with our exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code PNG for 20% off plus free shipping. I wasn't all that sure I was going to make any resolutions this year because <laughs> I'm just that rebellious or something. But alas, I have. I have resolved to react with love, not fear. To go out of my way to be kind to folks. To speak up. To start conversations with strangers. To be braver. A lot of you may be like, well, yeah, duh. Are you not a good person when you're out and about in the world, Kristen? Yes, of course I am. But I am also an introvert. <laughs> and I often wait for others to open their hearts to me. Not this year, though. Mm -mm. I am done waiting. I want to be the change that I want to see in the world. Now, these may seem like little things to do, little simple things. But my fair and brawny listeners, it's all a part of my master plan to be more confident because the little things that you do all add up to big things, big changes. Now, these are all part of my master plan, but there are many, many ways if one's desire is to become more confident, to do so. And it can all start with but a simple haircut. Everyone understands this. How good do you feel when you step out of the salon after a fresh cut and style? You feel amazing. If you don't, get you another barber, dude. But most people feel amazing, right? I know I do. So, why wouldn't you feel just as good about yourself when you mind all them other hairs on your body? The answer is, you do. You, you, you would. Lee and I both can attest to this. Manscaped's fifth generation lawnmower is not just a trimmer. It's a grooming sidekick. It's your favorite barber. 
It's your wing and hype man combined. Take just a little off the top or go incredibly smooth because you have the choice, baby, with these bad boys interchangeable skin safe blade heads. Wet or dry, doesn't matter. It's waterproof and is ready to go whenever and wherever you choose. Leave the grooming routine of old behind. Make the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra your partner in newfound confidence in 2024 and get 20% off and free shipping with code PNG at manscaped.com. Because nothing says Happy New Year like a deal that leaves your bod, balls, and budget feeling refreshed. Embrace a new you and definitely embrace a new trimmer, courtesy of Manscaped. All right. Special announcement time. The Paranorm Girl podcast, in collaboration with the Black Cat Report and Life Beyond Six Feet, will be launching the live-streamed epic adventure, BYOB celebration, cryptolotastically exciting and paranormally absurd, beer, booze, and boogeymen <laughs> in early February. This will be a monthly show. You don't have to do anything different to tune in or sign up for any new accounts or anything like that, as it will be simul streaming via the regular Paranorm Girl YouTube channel and possibly Twitch. I, I don't know yet. I, I really have to figure out my whole Twitch situation. Um, it will also be streaming via the Black Cat Reports YouTube channel as well. So lots of places and opportunities to watch the new show. I cannot tell you guys how excited I have been about this. I have been wanting to go live regularly for some time now. So when my buds, Damien of Life Beyond Six Feet and Gil of the Black Cat Report brought this idea into my purview, I was down, down, I tell you. Uh, more details to come as we get closer. Uh, but I, I think y'all are going to be way excited to watch and listen. It's not going to be your usual paranormal fair. And uh, it's it's not going to be the usual paranorm girl fair. So something fun, something different. And dudes, there may be some opportunities for you good folks to call into the show beyond rad. Ugh. So Stay tuned for more information as we roll it all out over the next few weeks, because I want and hope to see many of you there. Okay, housekeeping is done. Let's get this puppy started. I don't find anything attractive in explaining a mystery by bringing in another mystery. He was referring to Bigfoot being interdimensional. But this is John Green. He is quoted as saying this in the documentary Sasquatch Odyssey, which is a great flick that profiles the subjects of today's show. It stuck out to me. This quote, I feel, speaks volumes about the conservative personality of Mr. Green, his take on the subject of Bigfoot and his research and investigative style following his arrival to the subject. He didn't always believe <laughs> in Bigfoot. Uh, it took some really, really great evidence to take this skeptic to acceptance. John, who started out believing, again, Sasquatch to be a just a big old load of poo-poo, <laughs> would go on to become one of the leading Bigfoot researchers and chroniclers of the phenomenon and a renowned authority on the topic. He amassed one of the biggest databases for sighting and track reports in pre-internet days. He was affectionately known as Mr. Sasquatch. He also authored a few books, his more well-known being Sasquatch, The Apes Among Us, which has been uh, recognized as a definitive work and regarded as one of the best written books on the subject by the BFRO. And I picked up a copy, I picked it up, and I read it, 
And I have to agree. It is indeed one of the best. It was awesome to read. Um, he was an incredible writer, which is unshocking. Uh, I think both his talent for writing about and researching Bigfoot directly correspond with what John did for work. He was an investigative journalist, and he had obtained his master's degree in journalism when he was just 20 years old. Dudes. Now, back to the load of poo-poo here for a second. John really didn't think there was any there there when it came to Sasquatch. He thought it was nonsense. In fact, his first point of entry into this field, his first foray into the world of Mr. Foot, was an April Fool's joke, a, just a silly little story that he wrote for the paper about Sasquatch. Now, 1954 marked the year that he and his family settled in Harrison Hot Springs, British Columbia, and he would purchase the local newspaper. Three years after becoming owner and editor of the Agassiz Harrison Advance, his path would shift dramatically when a spicy little Swiss man named Rene de Hinden scuttled into his office inquiring about reports of abominable snowmen and the like in the area. I imagine at this monumental moment in time, John had no idea the turn his life was about to take, or that the crazy little rude loudmouth in front of him would become his partner in things Bigfoot. Call it confirmation bias, call it fate, Call it answers to a journalist now asking the right questions. But John would hear enough Sasquatch stories and reports over the following year by folks that he knew and respected that by 1957, he was on the case, so to speak. And the next few years were a blur of exciting events that just opened the floodgates. Just what a neat time in Sasquatch history. Like, like what an exciting time for John, but just <laughs> what a cool time in Sasquatch history, you know? Uh, John would start by applying his investigatory skills to actual cases. He would be the first to conduct a real interview with Albert Ostman about his abduction that had taken place 30 years prior. He also conducted an incredible investigation of the Ruby Creek incident, poring over countless pieces of documentation uh, from the original investigation of the case, print casts, affidavits signed by those involved, um, interviews with folks who were connected to the incident. Ruby Creek had him sent. <laughs> it, it would be a real solidifying experience for John. The following year, John would get word of hundreds of large footprints discovered in Northern California. He and his wife would race down to Bluff Creek. When I spoke on this uh, in the uh, history episode, the information that I found said John and June got lost but basically lucked out randomly when they pulled over on the side of the road and discovered some other tracks. Um, other sources say, well, no, the couple actually made it to the site that day, uh, but, you know, a, a, a day late and a dollar short. Um, the tracks had already been obliterated with logging equipment, but luckily found some other tracks. I, I, I just want to speak to this real quick. <laughs> it's a mini rant. Um, this is an example that is not a big deal because the story still ends the same, but it is one of the parts of Bigfoot research that I have noticed that has made it incredibly difficult to follow a through line since the start, since the start of the season. There are so many versions of these, of, of the same stories. And I am all about the small details because I'm all about relaying to you 
the small details. And it's hard to tell when those small details are the right ones sometimes. It becomes a much bigger issue in some cases when uh, details like people who were or weren't present or or reasons that certain folks had issues with each other or actual names of locations and incident dates are wrong dudes <laughs> it it gets a little hairy now i mean <laughs> i don't think there's an easy answer for this problem but it's it's frustrating for someone who is so ocd about the deeds. Back to John. When his wife discovered the tracks at Bluff Creek, he says he hadn't realized just how little he had expected to see anything at that point, and it was shocking, and the prints were remarkable. He noted the similarity in features between the tracks they were looking at on the ground and the print sketches he had from Ruby Creek, and being so far apart it it had him wondering how two separate hoaxers, not connected and, and far apart, like in distance, could have possibly come up with something so similar. They had a lot of the same details, and it just didn't make any sense to him. Uh, the years that followed were also very exciting for John. In 1959, he and Renee DeHendon would be hired by Texas millionaire and Yeti obsessor Tom Slick for the first major search for Sasquatch in the Pacific Northwest. Slick had already conducted many expeditions in the Himalayas in search of the Yeti when he turned his attention to the American version. The Pacific Northwest expedition was born and would bring three of the four horsemen of Sasquatchery together. Though it sounds like much to their consternation and frustration. Tom Slick would unfortunately die in a plane crash in 1962, abruptly ending the expedition. John, who would become a big advocate for the validity of the PGF, would meet Roger Patterson for the first time in 1965, years before the film was shot. The fact that he supported the film as being genuine actually says a lot, considering he was not a proponent of photographs being of any use as far as proof of Bigfoot, as he stated had been his assertion many times in his book Sasquatch Apes Among Us. Now, John first met Roger when he was working on his book, Do Abominable Snowmen of America Really Exist? And Roger had come to see John about using some of his newspaper articles for the book, including the Ostman and Rowe stories, which John happily gave him permission to use. Um, at this time, John and Renee were still in the throes of their Bigfoot partnership, continuing on with their investigations and travels, and would both stop in to see Roger if they traversed south through Washington State. On one of these trips, John would mention to Roger some tracks that they had just seen at Bluff Creek. Six weeks later, Roger and Bob Gimlin would capture the image of Patty at that same location. John Rene and Jim McLaren would be some of the first people ever to see the film after it had been developed. He would be instrumental in getting the film in front of real scientists at a showing at the University of BC. He and Rene would also secure Canadian lecture rights on the film. Didn't know that. June of the following year, would be the first time following the filming of the PGF that John would be able to make it back to the Bluff Creek site. With Jim McLaren standing in for Patty, he would shoot a recreation of the infamous Irish exit. And though his film and the original couldn't really be lined up to the exact T, thanks to his recreation and being able to compare the two, uh, he was able to garner some excellent information about the film's original actor, and it has been considered a critical piece in analysis of her height. So, yeah, 
he had some hands in the PGF. I just think that's that is so very cool. John would go on to write books on the subject of Sasquatch, publishing his first in 1968. In 1972, after 18 years of owning and running the advance, due to sales of his books being more than enough to sustain himself and his family, he sold his paper, though he would still write off and on for the advance as well as some other newspapers. Bigfoot would continue to play a a major part in his later years, and he would find himself recognized for his contributions to the field and sought out by so many who just wanted to pick his brain and and just meet him. Um, He also got into some other awesomeness that that just makes him so real and so human to me. Like, he's not just a famous name for Bigfoot. He He was a cool, smart, family man with with all these like hobbies and pursuits he he loved history he he was an investor a philanthropist a, a politician he had been elected as mayor of Harrison Hot Springs back in 1963 and then in 2002 he was elected to a commissioner's seat i just crazy cool i don't know it's cool it's so normal um but As for Bigfoot, John's impact was powerful, and his findings and contributions to the study of it, important and very long-lasting. Quite the journey for a skeptic turned Bigfooter (laughs) all in. Um this pioneer in the field would pass away on May 28th, 2016. Now, two things on John Green that I consider it a little just interesting Bigfoot trivia, if you will. Uh, I learned from Dr. Meldrum's book that he was the first researcher to suggest that Sasquatch might be Gigantopithecus which was an idea that massively affected the study and research of another of our four horsemen, Dr. Grover Krantz. And second, John Green would have a falling out at one point with our second horseman of today's show. Damage was done that would never be repaired between Green and his longtime Bigfooting comrade. With that, let's talk about Rene. I read far more about Rene de Hinden than maybe any of the other horsemen because he is a difficult character in this story to understand. But his part to the story is fascinating. Here's uh, the, the long and short of the feeling that I've walked away with from the Rene research. If you weren't with him, you were against him. He was a rabid dog who could be rather charming. He gave up everything in his quest for a creature he'd never seen and wasn't sure even existed. And if he were still alive today, he would probably do it all over again because he had this burning drive to find Sasquatch. And that was just who he was. Renee's life was rough. One month after he was born out of wedlock in Lucerne, Switzerland, August of 1930, baby Renee was put in an orphanage. He would be fostered out a year later by a decent couple, who provided well and took care of him until he was nine when his foster mother died. The father would take a new wife who didn't like or want Rene, so a couple of years in, he was sent to live in a boarding school. Even though things were going well and he may have found stability there, a year into his new arrangement, his birth mother would show up to claim him. He would only go to live with her 
her husband and his half-siblings for four months before he was put back into foster care, this time with a farming family who worked him incessantly. Renee would say that they weren't cruel people, just not affectionate. Renee would also say later, though, in his 73 book, Sasquatch, I was five steps lower than a dog. I was up before six every morning to clean out the barn and do odd jobs before going to school. And five minutes after I got home, I was out in the fields working. That went on for three years solid, no holidays. After those three years, he would once again attempt to live with his birth mother at 15 years old. After only two weeks, he left to live on his own and take care of his dang self. Can you imagine what kind of a person is formed when the first 15 years of your life looked like that? You might come out of that a bit hardened, mistrustful, resentful. All you have learned up to that point is that you are expendable, unlovable. The only value you have is in the labor you can provide. Nothing is ever certain. And you certainly can rely on no one but yourself. I'm hypothesizing about that. (laughs) But uh, a a childhood like that makes the adult Renee would become make a lot more sense to me. But anyway, Renee was on the go at this point, 15 years old, bouncing around, making money, taking care of himself. At 18, he got a passport and then proceeded to bounce around the whole of Europe, make money, take care of himself. In 1953, he would immigrate to Canada and began working on a dairy farm in Alberta. One day, he heard a report on the radio talking about an expedition being mounted to find the Yeti of the Himalayas. Rene, who had never heard of the Yeti before, was fascinated with the prospect and said to his boss, Now wouldn't that be something to be on the hunt for that thing? His boss responded, Hell, you don't have to go that far. They got them things in British Columbia. Rene described this as a life-changing comment, saying, A switch suddenly turning on in my head. It seemed like a great adventure. He moved to British Columbia the following spring and began his lifelong pursuit of Bigfoot. The first couple of years, he spent amassing newspaper accounts of Sasquatch and eyewitness testimonies from Vancouver newspapers, bulking up his research and just falling head over heels into this obsession. Until he walked into the office of the Agassiz Harrison Advance, inquiring about any local reports, and met with the owner and editor, John Green. Skeptical of anything Bigfoot, but of course, after hearing this little Swiss man's ideas about going out to hunt for the creature, John told Renee it was all nonsense and to go home. Though Renee's passion for the subject would not be rained on, he would head home a few days later. Green would write up a story about Tehinden and his interests and pursuit, put it in the paper, and thought, done and done. Well, a year later, the idea was floated to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the province of the Sasquatch hunt. (laughs) And Renee was front and center hopeful and excited to head it all up. The hunt would never take place, unfortunately. But the press this idea got was explosive and went everywhere. The Bigfoot phenomenon was ignited. Several credible reports of Sasquatch sightings in the area would surface, and Renee and John Green would join forces and began investigating. They were like two peas in a pod, over the next few years, and both brought on board by Tom Slick in 59 for the Pacific Northwest Expedition. DeHinden would describe the PNWE as a total (laughs) screw-up. 
from the get-go, it sounds like it was a train wreck. Tempers flared. Nobody could agree on anything. People that were involved seemed to be, like, trying to undermine each other. Um, both Green and DeHinden hated Peter Byrne. <laughs> uh, Renee would leave only a few months in because, according to him, his nerves couldn't take it anymore. Before he left, though, he was no peach to be around either. Uh, according to John Green's testimony, Rene had a nasty habit of pacing in front of the campfire and spitting into it. And while Rene tended to sleep in, another fellow was prone to rising early and firing his rifle. I mean, that would make me mad. Rene would lose his temper, go stamping off into the bush, and make so much noise that no creature would come within a mile of them. Man. Uh, Rene uh, wouldn't entirely withdraw from the field, of course, though he may have felt a bit disillusioned from this experience. He would continue to investigate incidents and talk with witnesses and spend time in the wilderness, sometimes weeks at a time, uh, whether he was sifting through evidence and traveling to new locations with reports alone or alongside John Green, his obsession did not waver. And in 1967, this obsession with Sasquatch would cost him his marriage. He and his wife, Wan Jatuan, would divorce in August 1967. The following month, he and Green would collect casts of some awesome tracks on their trip to Bluff Creek. And the month following that, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin would, of course, shoot the film scene round the world. I suspect the moment Renee heard the news of what Patterson had captured, or like the moment he watched it for the first time, was the beginning of the division between him and John Green. That is just my speculation. A lot of people uh, talk about other stuff and, and uh, nobody seems to really know how or when it started. But that that's just what I suspect. Um, from what I have read, uh, there were a, a few other things that took place. And then like dominoes that would take place over the next few years that would drive Renee into this just angry, <laughs> resentful place of no return. Um, though Rene would be involved in getting the film shown in many locations around the world, though he would take part in purchasing rights to show and lecture about the film, though he personally investigated aspects of it for years, re returned to the film site multiple times, and was an advocate for the film's authenticity. Inevitably, he was an advocate for that. Um, Rene was bothered about it. John Green put it this way, before the Patterson film, Rene enjoyed the spotlight. Patterson came along and eclipsed him. And, you know, on the same hand of that, um, Rene was shattered that someone else had captured evidence of Sasquatch's existence. Someone else had done the thing he wanted to be the one to do. Oh, situation stinks. Um, further stakes that would drive the men apart over the following years included Green's openness to the shooting of a Sasquatch in order to provide the type specimen required for science to take it seriously. Rene considered the cryptid to be more human than ape, and he thought this opinion disgusting. Also, Green's openness and friendliness to working and hanging out with folks like Bob Titmus, who Rene didn't like, uh, people like Dr. Grover Krantz, who Rene really, really did not like. <laughs> Oil and water, those two. Um, and then uh, the straw 
that appears to have broke the camel's back. Uh, Renee was a serious Bigfooter who wanted to keep his hard-earned information close to the chest and, you know, hopefully get the payoff and the accolades because of it. John Green was the opposite and wanted to share the information with others. And I want to ask you guys out there, um, if you're watching on YouTube, who, who is right in this situation? Comment below who is right in this situation. I, um, I do understand both sides of it. I understand working your butt off for years, doing the legwork that no one else will do, being involved to the extent of losing <laughs> losing out on things. Renee lost his marriage, his family, only to just give it all away. But, you know, I also completely understand the necessity, and it is a necessity for sharing what you have got for the greater good for further collaboration, you know, adding to the pool of knowledge and hopefully getting others to do the same. I don't know. Where do you guys stand on this? Um, I don't think it was too long after this that, uh, you know, it, it had to have been some time in the early 70s that Green squarely landed on Renee's ever-growing no, no list. Um, it was at least by 1976 that bad blood spilled over. Uh, and I am gathering that from a letter from Renee to Green that Todd Prescott talks about on the Sasquatch Archives YouTube channel. Renee had written to Green in 93, referencing the letter he'd had a lawyer send over back in 76, requesting Green at that time turn over all copies of the PGF and demanding money if he ever showed it again. He also demanded Green pay him for the photos of footprints Renee had taken at Blue Creek Mountain and John had used in his books. It's a nasty letter. You can just hear the venom from Renee. Um, Renee felt he was the owner of the photos since he had taken them. Green was operating under some understanding that they were sharing any photos the two of them had gotten on their investigations together. He had also been the one to invite Rene to the site to begin with. Uh, if it hadn't been for him, Rene literally couldn't have taken the photos. Rene would <laughs> write tons of letters of this ilk to Green and others, just harassing and bitter and resentful and ugh, just petty. Not not awesome stuff, but yeah, this went on for years. Uh, if he wasn't badgering you in public, as he so often did to Dr. Krantz, he was your angry elderly mother firing off nasty grams. Now, I think it's uh, it's pretty well known Renee fact that he supported himself and his Sasquatch trips uh, later in his life by collecting sh spent gunshot, spent gunshot, sorry, tongue tied. Uh, he would sell the lead, which, you know, anyone knows is not really great, you know, for your health and all of that. Um, and I've I've had thoughts about that regarding his progressively cranky, aggressive temperament in his later years. You know, lead poisoning is uh, is no joke. Ask your boomer parents. Um, I recently learned before he regularly did this on gun ranges, he actually began lead salvaging years before that when he operated a boat rental service in 1958 and was retrieving the spent shot that fell into Harrison Lake. So he was exposed to lead, like, for much longer than I thought. Um, made incredible money by 50s and 60s standards. Then again, he, he did get cancer and uh, was just a bear to be around. So, you know, got to take the good with the bad, I guess. 
Rene de Hinden never got to see the subject of his ultimate quest. Even in the 97 Kokanee beer TV commercial where he played himself, uh, it was right there behind him. And he didn't get to see it. He searched for almost 50 years and never found the undeniable proof that he was after. He never even found tracks on his own. He had to be shown or taken to them. And he had doubts. He questioned his pursuit. I just, I don't know. I, 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 I think I have a special place in my heart for Rene. Um, I just really wish he could have gotten to see something. Just, just one thing as passionate and dedicated to the subject that he was. He would die at only 71 in 2001 from prostate cancer, never having gotten to, uh, to claim his prize and following a lifetime of just being angry about it. <laughs> but um, he's not one to feel bad for. I am certain he would call you a moron if you dared feel bad for him. Uh, I will end Renee's part here with one of his quotes from a 1987 article. I just, I really liked it. He said, I have everything I want. I have an interest in something fascinating, freedom, and all the material things I want. The biggest mystery there is in North America, maybe the world, and I'm in the midst of it. He was as close uh, to a full-time squatcher as anyone is going to get. <laughs> he went for it, and he got to live out that great adventure. And you can't feel bad about that. Next up, Peter Byrne and Dr. Grover Krantz. We are going to follow up with these two remaining horsemen in a separate episode. Stay tuned. Both have got some fascinating stories as well. Looking forward to getting into that with y'all. Before we do our closing words here, I uh, wanted to announce the winners of the giveaway of the two copies of The Creatures Are Stirring by recent guest Gregory Fedora, Mr. Rex Robinette, and Mr. Alex Rondini. Thank you guys for listening and commenting and congratulations to you both. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure you hit the like button and subscribe if you are on YouTube or rate five stars on any audio platform. I sure appreciate it. Follow the show on the socials at Paranorm Girl Pod for updates and announcements. Stay in the loop, dudes. That may be a wrap for today, but you've got an incredible conversation with longtime paranormal investigator and author Richard Palmazano to look forward to next week. I will see you guys back here on Tuesday. Until then, stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open. Welcome to the future of legal THC, Mood's THCA flower. It's the most potent breakthrough in the world of federally legal cannabis. And now you have 10 high inducing strains of this smokable flower to choose from at hellomood.com, the best online dispensary that ships discreetly to your door. Great for beginner and veteran users, the experts at Mood have tailored different strains for curated moods. From euphoric and energized to creative and focused, Mood delivers the highest quality THC products you can trust. However you like to take THC, Mood enhances awe-inspiring experiences with versatile products that go with whatever mood you're ready for, like their great-tasting gummies, 
convenient pre-rolls, classic flower, and so much more. Try Mood's new THCA flower today. And for 20% off your first order, plus a free pre-roll of THCA flower, go to hellomood.com and use promo code PODCAST20. That's hellomood.com, promo code PODCAST20, for 20% off your order and a free THCA pre-roll.